Uh, thank you, Jim, for that uh, kind introduction. And also, thank you, Cam, and members of the ICBA for inviting me to join you today. I first went to ICBA's office in Washington to meet with Cam Fine to discuss the idea for the new consumer agency almost two years ago today. Now, Cam was very skeptical, and uh, he helped me understand why. In the time since then, I've learned a great deal for Cam, from Cam, and I value his insights. He encouraged me to talk with community bankers from all around the country. And from my first day on the job, when I met with community bankers from my home state of Oklahoma, I have followed his advice. As of last week, I have spoken directly with community bankers from all 50 states, from Hawaii to Maine to Florida to Alaska and everywhere in between. And I'm here today to offer my thanks for your help. Many of you in this room have taken the time to help me understand your businesses, and you've made sure that I see the competition you face from brokers and lenders that have not had oversight at the federal level. Many of you have walked me step by step through mortgage documents, uh, not a pretty sight. Uh, at a recent meeting in Chicago, a banker brought a stack of closing papers. You know, that's when I really want to back up at these meetings. Um, along with a comparison, the one-page note he had signed when he had bought his own house many years ago. And each and every one of you that I have spoken with has talked to me about the regulatory burdens that you face and your worry that if you have to spend all of your time with regulators, you won't have time for the families you want to serve. So I'm grateful to you for the time you've spent with me. I'm here today to talk about what I've learned, starting with three lessons in particular, and to talk about how these three lessons influence the development of the new consumer agency. So here goes. Here's what I've learned from you. Lesson number one, community banks build long-term partnerships with the families they serve. Now, I've studied the economic pressures facing middle-class families in my job as a law professor and as an empirical researcher. I studied families that worked hard, played by the rules, and then found themselves squeezed by an economic system that too often seemed tilted against them. In particular, I studied families who turned to debt to buy a home, to pay for an education, to cover the cost of medical bills, to start a business, to cover a job loss, or just to make it to the end of the month. I've spoken out for these hardworking middle-class families, and I will keep doing so. And that is why I have come to appreciate America's community banks. The valuable role that community banks play in our economy is on display every day. Most community banks and other small institutions build their business on long-term customer relationships. They make every effort to run their banks so that people know up front what they are getting and they don't get hit by nasty surprises later on. When there's a problem, they try to work things out. In other words, community banks work hard to be trusted long-term partners with the families they serve. I've heard from many of you about relationship lending. You know, community bankers in San Antonio talked about third and fourth generations of the same families doing business with their banks. Community bankers from small towns in Maine told me about making loans that big banks wouldn't touch, but that they knew were all right because they knew their customers. You've told me that you can't build your brand as a respected community institution by using surprise fees and other tricks. If someone feels like they weren't treated fairly, word gets around fast, and soon it's the talk at a little league game or in the checkout line at the grocery store. Now, let me be clear. That doesn't mean that every community bank is perfect, but you have made it clear that community banks strive to build their businesses 
around serving their customers in open and fair ways. And that's lesson number one. And it brings me directly to lesson number two. Community banks didn't cause this financial crisis. I often make the point that the financial crisis began one lousy mortgage at a time. You and I know that these mortgages were seldom originated by America's community banks. In fact, most of the abuses in the run-up to the latest crisis weren't to be found at community banks at all. While many community banks continue to provide high-quality services, the truth is that in the last two decades, the larger financial landscape has shifted. For a long time, the prices of financial services, credit cards, checking accounts, mortgages, and signature loans were pretty easy to see. Both borrowers and lenders could understand the basic terms of the deal, and that meant that community banks, bigger financial institutions, and the small number of unregulated lenders competed on a pretty level playing field. Those days are behind us. Low, low advertised prices on the front end are often made up by high, high fees and charges on the back end. Customers walk into a payday lender thinking that the business model is a short-term loan, not a trap. They go to a mortgage broker expecting that brokers must put the customer's interest first, not the broker's own interest. Too often, customers have no realistic chance of reading their credit agreements and figuring out the actual terms of the deal until it is way too late. In other words, they thought they got a cheaper deal somewhere else, but they didn't. So that's the second lesson for me. You didn't cause the problem. And that leads me to the third lesson that I have learned. Lesson number three, if we don't do a better job on regulation, we will push more community banks out of business. Let's face it, the regulatory pressures on community banks have increased substantially. The first problem is competitive. In the run-up to the financial crisis, the government's failure to set sensible rules and to scrutinize the practices of large banks and of non-bank lenders hurt the ability of community banks to compete. Community banks could offer clearer products that imposed far less risk on consumers and cost far less in the long run, but customers couldn't see that. And there are other problems. Some of the complicated papers that consumers receive at real estate closings, for example, are required by government regulations. This complicated, duplicative paperwork forces small financial institutions to reallocate precious resources away from serving customers and toward filling out more forms. During my many visits with you, I've heard about the high cost of regulatory compliance. I understand the difficulty of determining what is or is not required by a particular regulation and the costs that that creates. I appreciate the widespread anxiety and frustration over the future of community banks and other small financial institutions. I know that you want a regulatory structure that doesn't require an army of lawyers. Big banks may be able to afford all those lawyers, but you can't. High compliance costs can be devastating. This is what you've said to me in visits all around the country. Community banks work hard to build long-term relationships and long-term partnerships with the families they serve. Community banks didn't cause this financial crisis, and badly done regulations can weaken our community banks, significantly increasing the pressures they face. So how should the new Consumer Bureau incorporate these lessons into its work? Well, first, the consumer agency can serve the American people by embracing a strong, diversified banking system. 
For this Consumer Bureau to succeed, community banks must remain a major presence in the economy. Families across America must continue to have the option of receiving their financial services from these institutions. The new consumer agency needs to work with America's community banks to make sure that there are a range of services and options available now and in the future. Now, the agency can do its part by including community banks in the work of the agency from the very beginning. We need you there when we think about priorities and we map out directions for the agency. Involving you early in the conversation, giving you a meaningful seat at the table and an advance notice of what's coming will let us at the agency do a better job. So that's why we've worked hard to make community outreach part of the Consumer Bureau's DNA. We know that over time, even good intentions can go awry. So we're trying to build a structure that keeps the new consumer agency in partnership with those who serve consumers. You know, uh, in doing this, one of the first people we hired at the consumer agency was Elizabeth Vale, so that someone with a background in community banking would be able to raise a community bank perspective in all of our conversations. We encourage you, every single person in this room, to send your thoughts and suggestions to Elizabeth. I'm gonna give out her email address here. Some of you already have it, but I'm gonna do it again. It's Elizabeth, ordinary spelling, Elizabeth.Vail at treasury.gov. And I make you a promise, once you email her, you will never be lonely again. <laughs> She'll make sure that you know what we're up to. She'll make sure that we hear from you. So email Elizabeth, because we need you in partnership as we build this agency. Second, the consumer agency can aim at problems where they exist. We are committed to ensuring that all providers, including non-bank mortgage lenders and payday lenders, must follow the same rules for offering consumer financial products. As, as one community banker explained to me, we can't enforce the law only against the banks that are the easiest to find. Instead, we will build a strong enforcement arm at this agency that will, for the first time ever, put significant federal resources behind ensuring compliance by non-bank financial companies. That's why we anticipate that more than half our budget will be committed to establishing supervision and meaningful enforcement. We need to make sure that the non-bank companies also follow the rules. And the third thing we can do, the consumer agency can get smarter on regulation. You know, one of the amazing things about this new consumer agency is that it actually has the opportunity to cut back on regulatory costs. Yeah, with your help, we've set our first initiative squarely in mortgage documentation. We're aiming to consolidate the TILA and RESPA forms to create a shorter, cheaper form that consumers can better understand and that you can fill out more quickly and easily. When it comes to piles of paperwork, less is better for you and better for your customers. And when we get this done, we'll be on the hunt for other places where we can do the same thing. Find a way to give the consumer something that is shorter and clearer and to cut your regulatory costs at the same time. That's where we're headed. At the consumer agency, we believe in a business model based on the idea that what you see is what you get. 
That's good for customers and good for community banks. If everyone has to follow the what you see is what you get model, then there will be opportunities for community banks to grow. Right now, borrowers go to the lenders who they think are the cheapest. When the advertising says low cost or special deal, too often consumers don't know that the real costs are hidden in the back. It's hard to compete when you're telling the truth up front and your competitors aren't. When everyone has to make the prices clear up front, then customers can see good value. And customers may decide that selecting a bank for its good customer service and its willingness to work with a customer in the long term is a smart decision, not a costly one. That could be very good for community banks. This is an important moment in history. Much has gone wrong in the financial world, and there are many moving parts right now. We have only a brief time to get this right, so I'll strip this down to the basics. This consumer agency is dedicated to serving America's families. In the long run, these families need a community bank option. Change is coming. I want it to be change that gives families good choices and the chance to find long-term financial partners they can trust. I want us to work together for the right changes. Thank you for inviting me here today, and thank you for your help. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Warren. I understand that uh, you agreed to answer a couple of questions sure. for us this morning. First question I have for you um, is that you had mentioned that there are a lot of non-bank lenders that don't face the same rules and regulations that community banks face and aren't examined the same way. How will you level the playing field when they are, there are so many of them and they're so tough to monitor? Say wait with me. So it's, um, it's a good question. The first thing I want to say about this consumer agency is for the first time, we'll actually at least have the power to do that at the federal level. You know, we've never had the ability to do that. It's been all about federal regulation of banks, and the non-banks were scattered to the winds. Um, we also are going to have resources to do that. More than half of our budget will be committed to supervision and enforcement. Uh, and that means taking a hard look at the estimated tens of thousands of non-bank lenders. It's going to be a hard task. I, I won't kid anybody in this room. But the, uh, the first week I was there, we set up the office for community banks and hired Elizabeth Vale. The second week I was there, we hired the people who are going to do supervision and enforcement, who are going to set that up. Uh, and we, we um, brought into that job Steve Antonakis. Some of you may have known him. He was the head of bank and non-bank supervision for the state of Massachusetts. And Peggy Tui, who has been 17 years uh, an FTC lawyer working on non-bank supervision. And we have been working since that time to try to figure out how we can design an effective police force. Part of it is old-fashioned policing. It will be boots on the ground. It will be the regular form of supervision and examination, uh, going out and uh, meeting uh, institution by institution with as many of these non-bank lenders as they, we can. And some of it will be the new forms that we're managing in the 21st century, getting data from these institutions, getting these institutions registered, uh, monitoring what comes in uh, uh, from doing uh, analysis of what we see them produce. But I can tell you this, um, it's going to be a long job. It's going to be a job that basically never ends. But we will stay after it. We are committed to leveling the playing field, to changing from a world in which you compete against those who are unregulated or lightly regulated and pulling them in 
so they are subject to the same rules, so that they are subject to the same kind of supervision that the banks have. This is an important part of leveling the playing field for community banks, and an important part of making the financial world safer for American families. So that's what we'll be doing. We've heard a lot lately that CFPB doesn't have the same constraints on us as other bank regulators. How is the Consumer Bureau different from FDIC, the Fed, the OCC, and others? Okay. You know, um, this notion that we don't have the same constraints, I'm not really quite sure where that came from other than, let's face it, you've heard what we plan to do at the consumer agency, and there are some people who really don't want us doing that uh, and are, are out there uh, pushing back against it. So let me be real clear about this. We're subject to the same kinds of limitations and regulations as the other banking regulators. We're also subject to the same kind of limitations as the other agencies across government, the Administrative Procedures Act uh, being enforced by the courts, uh, ultimately being overruled by Congress. But the key point I want to make, I want to make two key points. The first is that we are different. We are different in two substantial ways. The first, um, we don't get to set our own revenues the ways that the FDIC, the Fed, and the OCC do. Um, we simply get a percentage of what it is that the Fed does. Uh, the Fed, in effect, has to tithe uh, for uh, consumer issues, and that becomes the budget of the consumer agency. So we're a little more constrained in that sense. And the second one is, a, is a, something we see in the consumer agency that exists nowhere else in government. And that is that even after the consumer agency has gone through all its rulemaking process uh, that is just like everyone else's, the consumer agency's rules can actually be overturned by a group of other agencies, uh, the FDIC, the OCC, what's called FSOC. If they vote uh, by a two-thirds vote to say we don't like that rule, then the consumer agency's rules are tossed out. So in that sense, the consumer agency is the most constrained of all the federal agencies. We've got nothing more than anyone else, and we've got less than all the others. Nonetheless, I think we have enough to get the job done. Um, we're going to need partners. We're going to have to be smart about what we do. But um, you know, when you're telling the American people that what you want to do is make prices clear, make risks clear, make it easy to compare products. You want to help them build long-term financial relationships with their banks. Uh, I think we got something good here, and we're going to get the job done. We will. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Warren. Thank you. Good luck this morning.